From the International Association of Marriage and Family Counselors, I'm Robert Caceres, and this is The Reframe. My guest today is Dr. Ramya Avendhanam. Dr. Avendhanam recently earned a PhD in counselor education and supervision from the College of William and Mary. During her time as a doctoral student, she taught a wide range of academic and clinical courses, delivered presentations at national and international conferences, and conducted research in the areas of multiculturalism and systemic practices. Over the past seven years, she's worked with individuals, couples, and families in a variety of settings. Despite her extensive training and impressive resume, Dr. Avendhanam has routinely encountered client concerns related to her competence as a marriage and family counselor. I mean, I'm very blessed that genetics makes me look a lot younger than what I am, but it does pose that challenge of exactly what you said. I, mean, I hear all the time, oh, you look so young. What experiences do you have that can help me? I'm double your age. Um, or I've heard this often as a family counselor, you're not married. How can you give me marriage advice? <laughs> so I always say, you know what? I may not be married, but I've been through some really significant relationships. And more than that, I've observed a lot of successful and challenged relationships in my life, whether it's marriage or friendship. Um, that being said, you are the expert of your life. And I'm simply here to help you in terms of the knowledge that I can bring. Just to reassure them that I have the book knowledge and they have the life knowledge. And then there are some things in life that I have learned that can be applicable, but we can talk about it and see what fits and then leave the rest behind. Welcome to The Reframe. Over the next hour, you'll hear Dr. Avedadam discuss how her doctoral coursework challenged her on both a personal and a professional level. She explains her process for respectfully broaching cultural issues with clients. She describes her ongoing struggles with perfectionism and offers tips for maintaining a balanced approach to excelling in a graduate counseling program. She also discusses how attending IMFC's Oxford Institute sparked her passion for learning more about international counseling. That particular conference was the start of many for me. And what I learned from that is exactly what we've been talking about, just the importance of learning from other people, from other cultures, from other countries, from other government systems, what they're able to put in place to see how we can better our standards as family counselors in the United States. Just as much as the world is learning from us and looking to us to standardize um, counseling practice, it's important for us to also hear their perspectives, to hear what the world is doing and to see whether or not we can do something different. And that's honestly what I love about our profession. I love that about being a counselor educator, about being a clinician, is that it's reciprocal. The learning never stops. I began our conversation by asking Ramya to speak about her educational background and current work. So I started as an undergraduate in psychology at Virginia Tech. And um, as I went through that process and I learned more about psychology in general, I really found myself gravitating towards um, the mental health profession. And so I remember trying to figure out what to do with the master's um, in terms of like what my next steps would be and counseling just came to mind. So I looked into specifically marriage and family counseling programs because um, I'm a South Asian woman and as I've grown up in a South Asian Eastern household, I've, I found it to be really important to understand systems and the influence of culture, family culture, religion um, on my life and understanding that entire journey holistically was really powerful for me. And so um, I went to University of Florida for a double master's in mental health counseling and marriage and family counseling and found my way into the PhD program at the College of William and Mary. Um, currently, I served as adjunct faculty over the summer at Marymount University. I taught both career counseling and marriage and family counseling. And um, I am looking forward to starting a private practice job as a clinician in January of 2019 in Arlington, Virginia. So I'm staying in the Northern Virginia area and I'm especially excited for an opportunity with George Mason University. I'll be teaching a um, grief counseling elective course. So currently that has been my journey and it's just exciting to see everything that I've learned put into practice 
um, in terms of student development, my own professional and personal growth, um, and working with clients. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Well, it sounds like from the beginning, you had a, a much more nuanced and kind of sophisticated understanding of the practice of counseling, or at least I would say much more so than I did. Uh, I kind of stumbled into marriage and family counseling, but you were already thinking about the complexity and importance of systems. How did you go about uh, in detail kind of investigating some of those things that immediately you thought were kind of of critical importance? You know, as you were saying that you found systemic thinking, I kind of fell into counseling myself with each experience that I went through. It just facilitated my um, inclination towards that area. So for example, as I was growing up, I realized that there was diversity in the Indian community. I hung out a lot with the Indian community because of my family. And if we're thinking about it from a developmental standpoint and from a racial identity development standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but it really didn't strike me until I went to college um, how different cultures were within India. And then of course, comparing cultural nuances um, between India and then other South Asian countries versus East Asian countries versus Western countries. And so as I started to make more sense of my own cultural identity and racial identity, um, over time, I started to piece together just how important things were systemically. So um, I would say that it was a, it was a step by step process for me. But um, I'm glad and really thankful to have come about that way of thinking because without that systemic piece, I think the work that I do with my students and with my clients would have been completely different and in a way lacking. Oh, I guess I, I would ask you to maybe speak more to like specific examples of how your cultural background or how your kind of lived experience has enhanced your approaches as either an educator or a counselor. Um, I think one of the key factors in my counseling tenure thus far has been my experience at the University of Florida and their approach to students. Um, they utilize Virginia Satir's self as a therapist approach. And going back and really critically evaluating my own life from a systemic view and um, having faculty mentors be part of that process was really powerful for me. Um, I, in particular, there's a class that I remember um, where we would do developmental journals and we would talk about the first 10 years of our lives and then the next decade of our lives and then for me, the last decade of my life um, in terms of how each decade fit with different psychologists, different developmental theories, and we had to critically assess our own lives. And so taking that approach and really analyzing where I've come from and what each moment meant was incredibly helpful. And I will say that going in for my own counseling during that period of time in my master's program and then once again in my PhD program was a critical part of that process as well. Understanding not only what that systemic context was, but how I internalized different moments of my life, um, how that manifested in terms of the choices that I made. So it was really wonderful to put into practice and to apply directly um, all of the knowledge that I was getting from my faculty members in terms of conceptualizing myself um, now and how I am the way I am now. So for that reason, I think it's so important when we're working with clients and when we're working with students to be able to view these different systems. Um, and honestly, that's kind of where my passion for systemic counseling came from. I think it's incredibly interesting how you characterize that time developmentally in terms of formation, not just academically, but personally. And a lot of times I, I think of students who maybe are interested in a master's program or a PhD program, and there's um, a heavy emphasis on wanting to be excellent academically without necessarily the recognition of the personal work that needs to go on. So I really appreciate you sharing about that. Also, you mentioned mentorship, and I would love to hear more about like the various ways that mentors helped you in the transition um, and consideration of moving from a master's program to a PhD program? Sure. Um, I was very lucky 
from the beginning to have incredible faculty mentors when I was at University of Florida. Um, Dr. Echevarria Doan is one of my favorite people. She is um, a powerhouse in family counseling and I was part of many of her classes and part of the advanced family clinic with her. So she provided the foundations of systemic theory for me. And I had my advisor, Dr. Pete Sherard, um, who taught me how to apply a lot of systemic theory as well within our, um, our advanced family counseling class. And so we, we talked a lot about theory and Dr. Doan was able to help me apply that. Um, on top of that, Dr. Sirisi Westolatunji um, was my professor in a lot of courses, but the key role of mentorship that she played for me is that of a research advisor. Um, during my tenure at University of Florida, we did not have that many research opportunities as master's students. And I recall that she provided opportunities to the mental health track, um, but marriage and family counselors and school counselors did not really have as much opportunity. So I remember one day I went up to her and I asked her, I said, you know, I'm not a mental health um, only counselor since I was doing both the mental health and marriage and family track. Will you please be my mentor for an independent study? And she agreed um, instantaneously. She was enthusiastic about supporting me. And so I was the only MFT at that time to, to join in. And um, from that came my first research study it was critically evaluating why first generation South Asian kids um, choose to hide certain parts of their lives from their parents instead of having earnest conversations. So we looked at that um, from a systemic perspective and we did a literature review and that was where my love for research began. Um, so having that opportunity was critical. And I remember having this conversation with her about whether or not I should pursue a PhD immediately. So I was debating at the time whether to go straight into a doc program or whether or not I should take some time to work as a clinician. And she was very strong about letting me know that it was important to take the time off, um, mainly because you wanted to really know from a client's perspective what their needs are, and from a population's perspective, what their needs are. She helped me realize that there's a huge difference between theory and then actual application. So what we read in the literature, unless it came directly from that population, is not going to be helpful because then we're simply going to be researching things that are irrelevant to a particular population or a sample. Um, so I, I took that to heart and took two years in between my master's and PhD program to be an outpatient therapist, a lead family therapist, and also a, a social worker. Um, I did a lot of work within a couple of school systems in Jacksonville and then at an outpatient clinic. And I, I, I took that time to really hear what various populations were saying in terms of what their needs were. And I, I think because of that, my doc program was so much stronger. Because of that, I focused my research in a very different way. So I was very lucky to have good mentorship at the master's level early on. Um, and I, again, got very lucky at the PhD program to have wonderful mentorship there as well with my advisor, Dr. Um, Victoria Foster, um, with Dr. Rip McAdams, with Dr. Tracy Cross, who isn't in counseling, but he does a lot of work with gifted education students um, in higher education. And so I've just honestly been very blessed and thankful for mentorship academically throughout my life. Yeah, it sounds like that initial step of just advocating for yourself, of kind of putting yourself out there and making that request, not necessarily knowing uh, what the response would be, opened up a lot of doors for you and through a lot of diverse experiences that you were able to have because you took those first initial steps. 100%. I would say the transparency from mentorship or people in mentorship has been very helpful for me in making choices in my life. So hearing their lived experiences definitely helped shape mine. Um, in addition, I would say that a lot of faculty members at the doc level um, involved 
us as doctoral students really early in research. Um, so from semester one, they had us writing papers with them, conducting research within our family counseling clinic. Um, so it, it was really great for me coming in as a doc student, not having to advocate as hard for myself, um, but knowing and learning from those experiences that I can advocate and that faculty members are willing to take me on. Um, so I, I felt less like a burden at that point. I remember at the master's level, I was thinking, oh, my faculty members probably don't have that much time to dedicate, but their willingness um, allowed me to be free of that in my doctoral program. And so advocating for myself became a lot easier and creating opportunities where opportunities didn't exist also became something that um, I became pretty well versed at. So I'm very grateful. Yeah, so as well versed as you were, I would imagine that there were still some surprises as you made that transition from the master's level to the doctoral level. Are there any aspects of that particular portion of your development that you wish you would have known about prior to entering? Oh, 100%. <laughs> um, I think w one of the biggest challenges for me was not having a structured path, um, which is both advantageous and poses challenges. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, typically when you come into a master's program, you have a, a well-structured program. You have courses that you take each semester. And at most, the difficult part was choosing an elective um, or two. Coming into the doctoral program, I had to think about what I wanted my cognate to be, how I wanted to shape my clinical experiences, um, what research I wanted to focus on if I wanted to make the effort to, to focus on particular areas, um, there, it was a lot more self-directed and there was a lot more freedom and I didn't really know how to sit with that. Um, and there's also this inadvertent way of conceptualizing yourself as competition with your peers. Um, I was very lucky that William and Mary's program was more cohort oriented and so that that sense of competition wasn't nearly as strong um, to begin with and really kind of came out as we started competing for faculty positions. But I had to remind myself at the beginning, middle, and end of that journey that we each bring a very unique narrative. Our backgrounds as who we are, where we come from, what we've learned, it makes us truly unique and that's what shapes the choices you make in terms of how you want to focus your research, what kind of clinician you want to be, what kind of a counselor educator you want to be, what theoretical orientations you're going to use. So each piece is different. And I, I had to let go of this idea that I'm competing with anybody. And I turned it into um, a mental conceptualization of competing with myself. So how can I continue to better myself as a clinician? How can I better myself as a counselor educator? How can I better myself as a researcher? Um, how can I vary my portfolio in my leadership and service? Um, and by doing that, I was able to let go of that perfectionism that's really difficult for a lot of us to let go of. This idea that we have to follow a particular path, we have to do things in a particular way. Um, and being able to let go of some of those perfectionistic tendencies were really helpful throughout my program. It got a little easier over time. Um, and tends to come back when you start to transition into new roles. So for example, transitioning from a master's student to a doc student was particularly difficult and brought back some of those feelings. And then again, same, um, similarly, it was like that from the master's to the PhD program. And whenever I started a new position, particularly as adjunct faculty, you kind of get those feelings back full force. But I, I had to fight that and realize that it was it's a learning process for me as well. And each experience will inform my own personal and professional development if I allow it to. So, yeah, I, I would say that that those those are some of the many challenges. Um, but again, I'm really grateful for the ability to think about it as a learning curve um, and a parallel process. Yeah, I mean, you had to navigate so many complex new roles and you're entering a new system and there's so many opportunities to do both challenging and exciting things. 
And like you said, like that tendency toward perfectionism, you know, can be certainly a temptation or all consuming. And you were able to kind of navigate through that. I wonder if there were any missteps or any particular challenges that you look back on as a touchstone and say like, wow, that was really informative. I've really grown from that. So I wouldn't necessarily consider any of the things that have happened as missteps for me, simply because each experience has been something that I've learned really important things from. But I will say um, one of an unexpected kind of twist in my doctoral program was um, a semester where I had a lot of personal things going on in terms of grief and loss. So I, I had an uncle pass away from ca cancer. And during that time, I was in um, an intermediate statistics course. And, and I, I really had a difficult time balancing my grief process, as anyone would, with the academic rigor of being a doctoral student. Um, and it, it, it manifested in that particular class more than any of the others. I did really well in all of the other classes, but for some reason, that class was simply a challenge. And so I actually failed that class. Um, and that was, a, that was a difficult time for me, because not only was I trying to make sense of my feelings and process and do everything that I could to, to stay productive, which was, as always, difficult. Um, I was very lucky that my faculty members were supportive, but that particular subject was one that I just could not catch up in. Um, and, and I took that as a learning opportunity. Um, I, I found a, a course at ODU that I could take online the next semester. Um, I I did so well that I passed with flying colors and I was able to transfer in those credits. But navigating the difficulty of knowing that my path was different from my peers, that they would graduate before me, they would be going out for jobs before me, that was tough to sit with for a while until I realized in the long run that it gave me more time to focus on what I wanted to do in terms of my dissertation topic, how I wanted to approach it. I was more thoughtful because I had the gift of time in a way, um, more so than my peers did to, to really hone in on what I wanted to focus on and how I wanted to do it with my dissertation. So I think in some ways it can be considered a misstep, but I learned so much from it and I benefited so much from it that I wouldn't change it if that makes any, any kind of sense. Oh, that makes absolute sense. And, and so, yeah, you've had your tremendous successes. You've had your, you know, opportunities to maybe have tough situations and, and definitely learn from them. Do you have any, uh, looking back on that time, any advice for current doctoral students? Yes. Um, so I will say I was very lucky to have a conversation with um, a, a faculty member from a different department. Um, and I remember he sat us down and said, let go of grades. Let go of wanting to get straight A's at the doctoral level. Nobody is going to look at your resume um, no one is going to look at your transcript. Um, really just take the time to focus on getting a little bit of what you want to achieve done each semester. And by that, he meant bringing to the table your research topics of choice. Find some way to bring the topics that you're passionate about into the classroom, into your research into everything that you do and try not to focus as much on grades. So yes, your work experiences and your topics are really important. Um, so all of that is going to look great in terms of what you bring to your portfolio, but try not to let straight A's be your ultimate goal. And in hearing that early on, that was really helpful for me. It allowed me to conceptualize my journey differently. So I, I didn't focus as much on getting straight A's. I focused on exactly everything else that he had mentioned. And that's where the opportunities and the connections came from. Um, I would also say to doctoral students um, or those who are thinking about going into doctoral programs to maintain contacts with your faculty mentors from before, whether you're a clinician who isn't going into a doc program or not, it's just always helpful to have their perspective and to learn from their continued research and from their experiences. 
um, being able to connect with all of my previous faculty members and faculty members that I've met through doctoral interviews and master's level interviews when I was applying for counseling programs um, has been really beneficial for me in terms of maintaining um, just a, a solid mentorship relationship with them um, and allowing that communication in terms of what next steps to take in each part of my counseling career. So mentorship is not something that is blocked into just your master's, just your PhD. Um, it's something that can be continued if you allow it to. So they are lifelong mentors of ours if we, one, allow them to be, and two, ask them to be. I, I would say those are the things that I would tell current students at any capacity, just maintain those relationships, know that mentorship is lifelong and, and try your hardest to let go of perfectionistic tendencies. Anxiety is always going to be with you. It's always going to sit with you. Your to-do list is going to constantly be full. There's never a day that I have at least five tasks that I need to accomplish. So it's okay for things not to be there um, and not to be done. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I would say. Just try to take tasks one task at a time. Oh, no, I think that's great advice. And at the beginning of kind of the insights that you shared, you mentioned how mentorship really helped stoke some of those passions that you have. And it sounds like being incredibly passionate about the work that you do does make it a bit more manageable on a day-to-day -day basis to do all of the things that's required of you. 100%. I remember in undergrad, one of my closest friends telling me that rather than go chasing after money in a profession, if you go after something that you love, then the money will follow. And I know that's difficult to accept at times um, because we are in a field where it's not the most lucrative in terms of pay, but um, you can find ways to supplement salary. And that's honestly one of the reasons why one of the many reasons why I wanted to get my PhD. I mean, not only did I want to become part of the gatekeeping process and be a mentor to rising counseling students and counseling professionals, but I also wanted to give myself the room to have diversified experiences. And you can do that with a doctorate. I love that I get to be a practicing clinician. I get to be a counselor educator. Um, I get to take part in service and leadership. I travel internationally for conferences and learn about international best practices from current clinicians. Um, our field just has so much we can do and it's never boring for me. So having those diversified experiences and having a flexible schedule in academia allows for me to be challenged in different ways all the time, which I love. I noticed on your CV that you've traveled to Spain, you traveled to England, you're about to travel to Scotland. What are some of those things that you really took away from you know, getting to work and study alongside clinicians who are working in other countries uh, that have helped kind of broaden your systemic thinking or your approaches to counseling different populations? I love that you asked me that question. Um, one of the main reasons why I go to international conferences, or at least my initial reason for going, I had done a lot of research in terms of literature reviews about best systemic practices in different parts of the countries um, within the United States and then best systemic practices abroad, so internationally. And I wanted to see whether what I was reading actually matched up with how clinicians were practicing in different areas of the world. And so going to my first few conferences and sitting in on so many different presentations from different areas of the world, be it East Asia, South Asia, um, Europe, it was really powerful for me to hear that what they were practicing was different than what was in the literature. So I know we talk a lot about evidence-based practice in research, um, and that is what informs how we approach clients in terms of being clinicians. It was beautiful for me to see that a lot of my colleagues in Europe and in Bangladesh in particular were doing things that were completely different from what I was reading in the literature. So rather than utilize, you know, um, 
evidence-based practices such as Bowenian family counseling, um, structural family therapy. They were utilizing a lot in Europe um, narrative family counseling. Um, and so hearing about their direct engagement with clients and the interventions that they're using and um, their passion for building more evidence-based practice really stuck with me. Um, that was one of the key reasons why I wanted to go. I wanted to see whether research and practice were aligned or whether there was some discrepancy between them. And um, in hearing that, it challenged me again to see um, how I can be different, how I can bring new things to, to counseling research in the United States, how we can explore, and then also create collaborations between programs internationally and with us so that we can do that more often. Um, as a counselor educator, something that I would love to bring to the table and that I continue to kind of say is my goal is to build programs where we can do an exchange between students internationally in systemic counseling programs and then in our um, marriage and family counseling programs so that we can learn directly from students and faculty in other areas of the world and then we can go and do the same from them. So I just, I love hearing about what's happening in the world. Again, it's this whole systemic understanding of, you know, the, the United States as a, as a separate entity, but also as um, a country that interacts with so many other places in the world. And we're, we're who a lot of countries turn to in terms of counseling standards and best practice. So I would, I would love to just see more collaboration. One of the conferences that you attended internationally in particular was associated with IAMFC. Uh, would you mind talking about what you um, learned and experienced at that particular conference? I would love to. IAMFC is near and dear to my heart. And that particular institute, at that point, it was the Northampton Institute. That was my first international conference. Um, and that conference was the main one to, to spur me on and, and to catalyst my passion for continuing um, to go to different international conferences. I met clinicians from Turkey um, and I learned about international practices from so many of our leaders in IAMFC who I'm grateful for. Again, mentorship is key and I'm very grateful to be connected to so many incredible clinicians and counselor educators in IAMFC. Um, but that particular conference was the start of many for me. And what I learned from that is exactly what we've been talking about, just the importance of learning from other people, from other cultures, from other countries, from other government systems, what they're able to put in place to see how we can better our standards as family counselors wow. in the United States. Just as much as the world is learning from us and looking to us to standardize um, counseling practice, it's important for us to also hear their perspectives, to hear what the world is doing and to see whether or not we can do something different. And that's honestly what I love about our profession. I love that about being a counselor educator, about being a clinician is that it's reciprocal. The learning never stops. Growing up, my parents always told me the moment you start to feel as if you're the master of something, that you've conquered a particular area of expertise, you're doing yourself an injustice because there's so much more that you can learn. Learning is a lifelong goal. It's a lifelong journey. So um, that particular institute really solidified that for me. Well, you mentioned the value of ongoing learning. And I'm curious about, you know, at this point in your career, or even like just this week of your semester, what is it that you're really interested or focused on kind of further developing your understanding of? In this particular moment, after reflecting on my summer as adjunct and reading my faculty reviews, I just want to keep being a better counselor educator. I've learned so much from my students already over the summer and throughout my counseling tenure thus far, um, particularly in my doctoral program. Um, and I, I just want to, I just want to keep being a better clinician um, and a better teacher and learning how to support and challenge my students appropriately um, based off of the environment that I'm in. So I'm really grateful that I'm getting all of these opportunities as an adjunct, but I would love to solidify a full-time position somewhere 
so I can be in one place um, and really just hone in on those skills. Um, as I'm learning to navigate being a counselor educator and applying all of my doctoral theory to knowledge, that's my goal. That's my goal is to continue to push in each of these areas um, and to continue to learn. Have there been certain things that people have said to you that have been encouraging or particularly informative as you navigate that process of becoming a full-time counselor educator? Yes. Um, one of the, the biggest takeaways for me as adjunct faculty um, that I got from my students is how much they appreciate providing real-world examples for them, so helping in bridging the gap between theory and practice, and the conversations that we've had about systemic conceptualization of clients. Um, the reason why I bring up that in particular, uh, I taught a marriage and family course over the summer, and a lot of those students were mental health track, pastoral counseling track, and it was their first family counseling class. It wasn't a requirement, they took it as an elective. Um, and it's something that they said stuck out to them, being able to apply family counseling, even if it's one-on-one -on -one with a client. We often discussed the importance of a system being able to adjust to the changes made, even if you're seeing somebody one-on-one, -on -one, um, for that person to sustain the changes that have been made throughout the counseling process and the therapeutic process. So that realization for them that you can still use systemic theory and systemic conceptualization while working one-on-one -on -one with somebody was really powerful. And so that's something that I wish to continue to teach. And it's why I'm so passionate about marriage and family counseling. Just the idea that systems can be applied in any situation, whether it's in a school system when you're working with a, a child or within a private practice setting or anywhere else, um, just the importance of being able to support somebody in a holistic way. Um, hearing that from my, my students was exciting for me. So that's when I knew I was doing my job as a systemic therapist. <laughs> Yeah, I hear so many people say like, oh, you know, I need to dedicate myself to counselor education. I don't have time for clinical counseling. And then there are those who maybe do a little bit of both. And then those who are full time who still make time to do clinical counseling. And I, I feel like for those who do clinical counseling, and, and this is just my perspective, not saying that one's better than the other, that as you mentioned, that clinical work is so informative that it does help to bring those, you know, current real life examples to the classroom. I completely agree. For me, personally, I'm not the type of person, if I wasn't seeing clients, to necessarily stay relevant. I think a lot of people, they can be clinicians and they can you know, go to continuing education courses and stay relevant um, through their passion for what they do. But I'm somebody that needs a structure um, or interactions to be able to stay current. And so being able to continue to see clients while I'm full-time faculty also, if I am able to um, secure a position soon, is, is critical for me. Just knowing my personality and who I am, it's something that I wish to keep and that I encourage my students to keep um, if they can as part of their development personally and professionally. So earlier when you described your educational work, you mentioned that you focused on both systemic thinking and multicultural approaches. And I'm curious about other areas that multiculturalism has influenced your counseling or enhanced your approaches. Honestly, it has impacted just my daily interactions with people. When I have conversations at the grocery store or at various social engagements, I'm finding myself thinking about multicultural context, political context, just a, a more broad worldview. And I try to understand each interaction from that perspective now. So I try to put myself in their shoes and I think, okay, what are some of the things from what they're telling me has influenced them or brought them to this point? And it has honestly led to some surprisingly wonderful conversations about culture, inclusion, um, how to approach 
life and interactions every day. And I love sharing those stories with my clients as well as my students. Um, I, I think it's so important for us to be able to contextualize and conceptualize people from their own narratives and to try and be empathic to where they're coming from, regardless of what their standpoint is. And in doing that, I've bonded with people in wouldn't ordinarily bond with. So that's been very, very influential in the way that I approach people. And it sounds like just in everyday interactions, that's something that you've intentionally worked on and maybe comes a bit more naturally to you. And yet that can be a, a challenging thing in a clinical context. How do you broach issues, just generally speaking, of culture with clients who have very different backgrounds? I think so much of it comes from being your authentic self, if we're going to speak from a Rogerian perspective, um, bringing your authentic self to the counseling session and being transparent. Um, I believe in transparency. I believe in honesty um, with my clients because, and my students, to be honest, um, because when they come in and they're looking to you to be a part of their journey, their therapeutic journey or their professional journeys, there's a sense of wanting to know and trust who they're working with. So I believe in transparency to a point. I think it's important as clinicians, as counselor educators to be transparent and to be honest um, without crossing that line of sharing too much. But I, I do approach conversations and bridge conversations with both clients and students saying, you know, this, this is my background, this is who I am, um, but you are the experts of your own journey, and I'm simply here to facilitate. But if you want to get to know me because trust is really important, feel free to ask me questions. I'm happy to answer them. And um, I, I broached the subject of multiculturalism and ethnic differences by saying, you know, in, in particular contexts, there could be power differentials or hesitation in having these conversations. I hope you know that I'm comfortable having those sorts of conversations with you. Um, and when you're ready, I'm here for you. And I'm, I'm here to be part of that conversation. I will not be offended. So let's let's broach these difficult topics. Um, and I think in, in saying that, saying I can handle these conversations, and then allowing your clients or students to be the ones to facilitate and to initiate those conversations when they're ready is critical. I recall when I was in my doctoral program. I was the program coordinator and a doctoral intern at New, New Horizons Family Counseling Center. Um, it's a program that is in place um, where we provided free family counseling services to the seven surrounding school districts of the Williamsburg, James City County area. And I had a client um, who is a mom of two, two really young kids, an autistic um, toddler and a really young little girl. And um, her background is that her family, her ethnic background is that they're Thai. So they're from Thailand. And her partner is from Latin America. And um, so she was talking about the cultural nuances and the difficulty trying to balance, pick and choose, what they as parents wanted to teach their children and how different their parenting approaches were. And being able to tell her that, you know, I can understand the difficulty coming from a South Asian background and growing up in the United States, um, was it, it led to incredible discourse about a lot of the journey for her coming in as an immigrant later in life and not really understanding Western culture and navigating that and then how difficult it was as a parent when she became one um, in terms of what to teach you know she wanted to teach her her children the language and in literature one of the big pushes and at least for South Asian women that I saw is that um, South Asian women often tend to think that when they move to the United States or any other country that they will let go of their traditional ways of being 
and are going to be a little more adaptive um, and acculturate to the host culture. So in the United States, it would be to American culture. But research actually showed that when a first time mother comes to a different country from her country of origin, that there is a push for tradition because once they get to the new host culture, they feel this immense sense of loss, loss of identity, loss of culture, loss of who they are. And so there is a greater push for language, greater push for food, greater push for seeking out those who are of similar cultures. And having that conversation with her and talking about research, talking about her life experiences, talking about a little bit of mine, just led to a greater therapeutic alliance. The trust increased to such a level that if we didn't broach that conversation together, I just wonder if things would have felt less complete with her. I feel as though, I I feel grateful that she felt understood and she voiced that with me. So I, I would say that in moments like that, that's when you know as difficult as conversations can be about ethnicity, religion, culture, um, trauma, anything that you can bring to the table um, after you've established safety in the room can really lead to powerful discourse and incredible change within a therapeutic setting. Yeah, you acknowledge that it's important to kind of broach any topic that might be in the room. And one that comes to mind, at least from my experience, and you know, we're both new professionals, do you ever get clients who are just like, well, you know, you look incredibly young or like how much experience do you have? And you have to kind of broach the topic of age. All the time. I mean, I'm very blessed that genetics makes me look a lot younger than what I am, but it does pose that challenge of exactly what you said. I mean, I hear all the time, oh, you look so young. What experiences do you have that can help me? I'm double your age. Um, or I've heard this often as a family counselor, you're not married. How can you give me marriage advice? (laughs) Um, And to that, I remember asking this question to my mentors at various points in my life. And there's one piece of advice that really stuck out to me from Dr. Pete Sherrard. He said, just remind them that you are not the expert of marriage or your clients' lives. Say that you have the background and the knowledge to help guide them as clients who are the experts of their own lives. So I always say, you know what, I may not be married, but I've been through some really significant relationships. And more than that, I've observed a lot of successful and challenged relationships in my life, whether it's marriage or friendship. Um, That being said, you are the expert of your life and I'm simply here to help you in terms of the knowledge that I can bring with my clinical background. Just to reassure them that I have the book knowledge and they have the life knowledge. And then there are some things in life that I have learned that can be applicable, but we can talk about it and see what fits and then leave the rest behind that doesn't. So that's tremendous advice. But I also think about the students out there who it's just like drilled into them, like very rarely self-disclose or you know, it better be in the client's best interest if you're going to self-disclose. And I wonder if they hear your comfortability with being honest and transparent and they're like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. And it, it makes me think about what your process is or kind of what your mindset is as you're making that determination to be as honest and transparent as you are. How do you formulate what to say and how much to say? I think there is a stigma when it comes to transparency. And it is hard for a lot of not only students, but even current counselor educators to do that. Um, They don't necessarily encourage it. Um, And I've gotten challenged a lot, honestly, over over time. Um, People have asked me that question, um, even when I do like supervision tapes, like, do you think that that's too much? And when I explain my rationale, usually people see the reasoning for why I would use self-disclosure in that moment. Um, I will say it is uncomfortable to share 
like vulnerable pieces of yourself. But I truly believe in modeling for my clients and for my students. I don't want to tell people to be vulnerable if I'm not willing to do that myself. And so the reason why I choose to be transparent and teeter that line between sharing about myself and oversharing um, very carefully is because I want to show that I'm willing to take the same risks. I would never ask my students or clients to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. Um, and, and that's the reason why I broach topics and, and teach in that way across the board. Um, but I would say, like, just remember your own client experience. Like, if you've been through counseling, um, remember what it's like in those initial moments. And, and also remember the growth and development that has been had once you've shared and once you've been able to be vulnerable. Even if it's not in a counseling situation, maybe with a friend, maybe with a family member, if you've had those sorts of, sorts of conversations, just remember what that was like. and. Think about how much more that trust and openness and freeing um, it was to be able to have those conversations. That's that's what I encourage. Like remember those outcomes, and hopefully that will be the motivator to be able to push through the discomfort. And counseling across the board is an uncomfortable process. I mean, we have difficult conversations, and we reveal parts of ourselves that are just so great. Um, within a counseling setting that, of course, when you are approaching your own clients, you're going to feel those those feelings of hesitation. Um, but if you do so thoughtfully and if you seek supervision for it and make sure that you are not crossing lines, then it's it, it can be perfectly appropriate. Yeah, to me, it sounds like textbook self-disclosure that, you know, there is a, a very solid clinical justification for what you're doing, that it's always of the mindset of this is going to enhance the therapeutic alliance and this is in the client's best interest. And it sounds like it's been incredibly rewarding and powerful, uh, the encounters you've had because of your willingness to be, you know, a risk taker and to maybe do something that might be seen as um, potentially a challenge and yet you've embraced it. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And I would say that I'm a calculated risk taker. So that's important. It's important to think about when you are self-disclosing. Is this in the client's best interest or is it to further my own need to talk about something? If so, seek supervision or go through your own counseling process. I strongly recommend for students especially to go th for counseling even if it's a random day and there's really not that much to process just to see what that process is like. Um, because I think that also added to my experience. Being a client to someone else was really helpful for me to understand what the process is like for clients. It, it allows you to empathize at greater and deeper levels. Um, and so I would, I would strongly encourage that. But taking calculated risks, making sure you get the supervision that you need and making sure that at each step that you are doing the best you can and providing best, best practice, um, that's what's important. I want to thank you so much for you know, the many insights and experiences that you've been willing to disclose and, and sometimes very vulnerably and honestly. Um, it just makes me think about, like, again, as I said earlier, we're both new professionals, and yet you've demonstrated so much expertise and so much competence and so much passion. And I would ask you, what might be some final words of encouragement that you might offer to the new professionals out there who may wonder if, you know, do I have enough expertise to be a leader yet? Uh, do I have enough accomplishments to try and advance the profession? The advice that I would have is to simply be gentle with yourself and remember that it's a learning curve. Each time you take on a new role, it's going to be a fun but difficult transition. And we need to allow our, ourselves the time and the space and the learning curve. I know a lot of the time one of the difficulties with any kind of transition is that we feel as though we need to be 
at a certain place at a certain time and we have to know everything by a certain time and goals are great to have but I think it's also important to remind yourself that sometimes these things take time and it's going to look different for everybody so to just be patient with yourself um, and to be understanding give yourself the same amount of prioritization that you would somebody else that you care about whether client student loved one um, we need to be accepting of of our own process and be realistic about it as well so one of the other challenges to being a, a new professional in any role honestly um, is is this idea that we are imposters um, and this feeling that we're an imposter and I, I felt that very strongly during my my summer as adjunct faculty and I'm sure I'm going to feel that going into my new adjunct faculty position in the spring it's really difficult to sit with that and to think okay I have I have the privilege the honor and the power to influence the lives of others and yet I just got out of school um, but again going back to what I was saying about being gentle and kind to yourself, I have to remember that it's a parallel process, that as I'm learning to be a faculty member, my students are learning to be counselors, um, practicing clinicians, or my doctoral students are going to be faculty members themselves. So I, I very honestly tell them, this is a learning process for me too, and I look forward to learning from you as much as I hope I can instill some of my knowledge um, into your professional journeys. Um, so that feeling is real. I don't know if it ever goes away, but again, thinking about it from the perspective of, I need to be gentle with myself and understand that you become an expert in your field only with experience, and this is my only way to gain experience. So that's what I keep telling myself. That's a wonderful recommendation. And throughout this conversation, You've mentioned narrative therapy. When I think of narrative therapy, I think of the saying, we live through our stories. And just as we wrap up, I'd love to hear about a time where there was a narrative in your life or a story that you told yourself that maybe was problematic or it certainly wasn't helpful. And you were able to reframe that reality in a way that was positive and more hopeful. So growing up, being a part of a South Asian household, there's a moment that stuck out to me when I was younger, and I internalized that throughout my adolescence. And that moment was when I brought home a 97 on my math exam. And I was one of the few girls who was in an advanced math course um, because my parents encouraged me to do it, even though I didn't think I was quite at that level. But when I brought that exam home, my dad, I love him, but he said, where's the other 3%? Good job on the 97%, but where's the other 3%? And so I internalized that even a 97 just wasn't good enough for my family. Now that changed over time. When I went to college, I had a difficult time with adjusting um, to being independent. Again, going back to a lack of structure, I do well when there's enough structure where I have freedom, but not a complete lack of structure or too much structure. And so when I was struggling there, I didn't feel as though I could share with my family about my experiences, about my struggles, because I felt like I wasn't good enough and I wanted to prove to them that I could be good enough. I wanted to do it on my own and then come back to them. And I remember processing this in my master's program when I sought my own counseling and, I, and my therapist told me that it is so important for me to let go of that. He said that my parents, during the time, during my undergraduate journey, they came around. My mom was at my meetings with everyone that I needed to meet with. They were supportive. They just wanted me to be okay. But I had hung on to that moment from when I was in third or fourth grade. And I internalized that and I kept blaming them for it. When he told me that piece, he was like, it's not them, it's you. You're the one who's hanging on to this. They've clearly changed and evolved. You need to make sure that you're not blaming them for things they're not responsible for and take accountability for what you're responsible for, 
that was the reframe that changed my life and changed, honestly, my relationship with them. I was already very close with my family, but I became closer because of it. And those are the powerful moments. Those are the critical moments in therapy that just kind of happen. You never know what sticks with your clients. You never know what's going to stick with you. But I was very lucky to have had that moment and have that reframe because that truly changed so much in my life. The Reframe is a production of the International Association of Marriage and Family Counselors. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review the show in Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. Join me next month on The Reframe.